Welcome to um, the third day of IU Ideas In-Depth Week on Homelessness. Uh, today's session is Stitching the Patchwork of Homelessness Resources Together. I am so glad you joined, and I think in a few minutes you will be too. In this session, we're going to be talking about the system of resources that folks without housing have to navigate, uh, the system of funding and services between nonprofit and government entities, and how it can all uh, better serve those in need. My name is Elijah Dishas. I'm a features reporter here at the Gazette, and I'll be your moderator for the session today. I'd like to take a moment to thank ITC Midwest, who is our presenting sponsor for Iowa Ideas in Depth Week. We're glad, them, glad to have them back again with us this year. Uh, and we have a lot to talk about, so we're gonna jump right into it. But uh, before we get into our discussion, I want to give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Up first on our panel is Sarah Buck. So Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here in Cedar Rapids. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Buck. I'm the Housing Services Manager for the City of Cedar Rapids and uh, our division oversees uh, the Section 8 program as well as all of the um, community development block grant funding. Um, so grant funds that come through the federal government to uh, basically pay for housing development um, as well as social services. Thank you. Next up, we have Janae Newman. Janae, tell us about yourself and your work here in Wynn County. Yeah, I'm Janae Peterman. I'm the Director of Housing Services at Waypoint. Um, and we are essentially that front door entry point for households experiencing a housing crisis. And then we do all of the resource um, navigation and coordination within the community to get people connected to the appropriate housing intervention. Um, and I've been with Waypoint for about 10 years now. Thank you. Next, we have Aaron Sullivan. Aaron, tell us what you do in Iowa City. Hi, I'm Erin Sullivan. I'm the director of housing uh, for Shelter House um, in Iowa City. And we here at Shelter House have uh, a 70 bed emergency shelter, a temporary winter emergency shelter. Um, we are the lead agency for coordinated entry in Johnson and Washington County. And then we have a number of different housing intervention programs that we operate. Um, some of those names might be familiar to you, such as rapid rehousing or permanent supported housing. Um, and But we provide short-term and long-term housing interventions to help people move out of their experience of homelessness and maintain that housing and stay stably housed long-term. Awesome, thank you. And then last but certainly not least, we have Amber Lewis. Um, Amber, tell us about your role and your work over in Des Moines. Hello. So yes, I'm Amber Lewis. I um, work for the City of Des Moines in the Homelessness Policy Administrator role. And the role was just created last year, so I started um, in April for the first time. So learning a ton. Um, prior to that, I was with the Iowa Finance Authority for 13 years, um, also working on homelessness programs. Thank you. So um, in Iowa, the support system for homelessness is, uh, you know, a patchwork in the truest sense of the word. Um, each of our largest cities has multiple nonprofits dedicated to these issues. Um, and then we have, you know, various positions, positions in city governments um, dedicated to housing and homelessness. Um, and each of those entities relies on a number of different, um, you know, state grants, federal grants, and often um, private fundraising as well. Um, you all have been involved in this field for over 10 years, I believe. Um, so give us a lay of the land right now and tell us how Iowa's system for addressing homelessness compares to, you know, what you've seen in other cities or states outside of Iowa. Let's start with Amber since she was the last one here. Okay. Um, so I think that resources are stretched really thin. I don't think that's going to be a surprise to anybody. Um, the cost of services has, has grown and become more expensive and service needs have grown. Um, you know, we just came out of this pandemic and there was some additional federal funding that came with that. So that was really great. But of course, um, those programs are ending and that creates a strain to figure out kind of how to fill those gaps. Um, also, of course, when never using federal funding, um, they're very complicated and generally a project um, is layering different funding sources. So, um, you know, all the complexities of each program and their timing needs, all of that, um, just always very complicated to put those together. Um, but certainly key state funding, also key in the shelter assistance fund is one source of funding um, for homelessness programs. And that's about 1.3 million for the state. Um, so certainly helpful, just funds basic shelters, keeping them open and operating. 
Um, and then of course, um, you know, local local funding, um, my position being being an example of that in Des Moines. Um, and we really are just kind of in the early stages of figuring out um, where the, the city can be a, a stronger partner and kind of fill in some gaps. Um, but just so important that it's it, it's just going to take everybody, um, private and public partners kind of pulling together. Um, um, it's just a lot of complex needs to, to address. Absolutely. And we're fortunate to have, you know, um, Janae, Sarah, Aaron, you know, great representation of uh, the corridor, Lynn County, Cedar Rapids, Johnson County. Um, you know, tell us the lay of the land in the side of the state for homeless services. Yeah, I, I guess I'll jump in. Um, you know, we we all operate off of this coordinated entry system, and it is a statewide system um, that allows us to collaborate with one another um, and allows individuals to move to housing opportunities across the state if that's what they need to do. Um, so that's one of the ways that um, we're working together as a as a whole. Um, and, and that's nationwide. So that's mandated by the federal government that anybody receiving federal funds operates through this system. Um, it, it works, um, it can be challenging if we have um, partners and individuals who struggle to understand the importance of prioritizing your services and ensuring that your services are going to the highest need. Um, and it's important that we integrate diversion into those systems. So that's really where we're at right now is really helping educate the rest of the community and educate the rest of the state um, on the importance of diversion efforts um, to integrate that into coordinated entry so that our system is no longer overwhelmed or we can reduce the strain on, on our system. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just gonna jump in and say, I think you know, in the last 10 years, we really have seen considerable change, especially since the pandemic hit. Um, so we, you know, we, the city and the county both jointly fund an overflow, winter overflow shelter that's open uh, between November and March of every year. And we've been doing that, I think, since 2015, so nearly 10 years. Um, and what started out with, you know, serving maybe about, you know, 20 to 30 individuals, um, you know, over that winter time frame um, in that shelter to now, you know, 100 plus individuals, um, that are seeking that those shelter that shelter and those services, um, and you know during the pandemic that was open for 24 hours a day, you know for about a year, um, and then transitioning back into kind of just that winter overflow shelter. So we've seen a huge, you know, kind of flux in our numbers um, as well as uh, the types of services we provide, as well as the coordination between um, all of us and all of our our, our different uh, agencies. So I think just in the last 10 years we've seen a huge increase in um literal homelessness but um also um i think that's pushed us to um continue to collaborate more and and figure out what's happening why are these you know all of the different other things that are impacting um homelessness in our community yeah and then aaron i know um johnson county recently saw an increase in your winter um point in time count which is um the annual count that you folks do to um figure out you know, what our population looks like and who is literally out there um, sleeping in places not meant for habitation. Um, have you also been forced to look at, you know, what is causing this all and how it all links together? Um, yeah, of course we have. And yes, so every um, city across the country does a point in time count on the um, third Wednesday in January, and it's a national count just to get uh, a census of how many people are outside and or in shelters across the country. Um, and like you mentioned, uh, Johnson County and Washington County, we did see um, some increase in those numbers compared to last year. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we also um, as an agency and as a community have just really been talking a lot about is the change in population that we've seen over the last five years um, and the complexity of their um, health needs, both behavioral health and physical health, and how that is impacting their, their housing needs. Um, and so as we are seeing, um, you know, potentially beds across the state um, be reduced for different reasons, it's also it's those individuals are having to go somewhere. And unfortunately, the homeless response system is, is part of that 
um, system that is catching those individuals um, and then trying to find appropriate housing interventions for them in our community that's also affordable is a real challenge. Absolutely. Um, you know, before we get too into the weeds here, uh, you know, an important feature of Iowa Ideas is, you know, knowing where we are right now and also knowing a little bit of where we came from. Um, how does our system today compare to the way the system worked in, in years past? How has the process gotten more collaborative or, um, you know, maybe improved to better serve our clients since you all started doing this work? I can jump in and speak from um, our local community here within Cedar Rapids. Um, since the inception of coordinated entry, which we started in 2017, um, obviously we all now work together and we accept referrals from a community wide list of those that are experiencing a housing crisis. But prior to that, um, households really had to navigate that system on their own. Um, and so it really was just, you know, figuring out what agencies are providing services, calling each agency, turning in applications to different agencies and seeing what they might qualify for. Um, there was really no collaboration amongst the agencies. We all kind of were doing our own thing and picking and choosing who we were serving and, um, you know, serving it, whoever just walked into our doors. Um, but this coordinated entry system really allows those with the highest needs experiencing homelessness within our system to be at the forefront every single week. All of the providers get together. We um, discuss what are the options for these individuals? How can we best serve them? Um, so that's really changed locally. Um, and then we've, we've even evolved that further to take that into our prevention route. So now all of the the providers that provide some rental assistance relief for those that might be behind on rent all operate together in a system like this where we collaborate and we ensure that our resources are used effectively within the community. Um, so it's it's been amazing to have this level of collaboration. Yeah. How about for the rest of you? Um, have you seen things get better with this coordinated entry system? Well, I'll just jump in briefly. I love the way Janae talks about that. That's so terrific. Um, of course, I'm new to the city, so I don't have quite that history with the city to see, but um, but it reminds me of, um, you know, part part of my job, I, I spend a lot of time researching other cities, and Houston is one that just has been in the news and received a lot of attention for some of the progress that they have made. And um, they always, one, one thing they always attribute that success to is just that, that sense of collaboration. Um, and the metaphor always sticks with me of everybody rowing together. Um, maybe that's not a very Iowa metaphor. I don't know, but um, but I, I just yeah, it's it's so key. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say that we've seen similar. I mean, the collaboration across um, human service agencies uh, within Johnson County is coordinated entry has done. Uh, great things for that. I mean, to have a centralized time each week for those agencies to get together um, and also to, to make sure that um, we are that these uh, agencies are kind of maximizing the support that's available for the individual rather than having, as Janae has talked about, going, you know, door to door to try to figure out what uh, what program they qualify for. It kind of takes that all of that um, stress off of the individual because they're already dealing with enough stress of that potential um, housing insecurity situation that they are facing to allow them the providers to say, hey, we have the appropriate funding stream for this individual and we'll take on the responsibility to reach out to them. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Janae pointed to this out as well, but one of the things in terms of change that we've seen in the last 10 years is, you know, pre-pandemic, there weren't any funds for prevention services. We were a homeless response system, um, which means that, that we were we were responding to the crisis that had already occurred. Um, and it was really challenging because you stand in your, you know, buildings or in your community and you want to be able to help and assist and prevent that experience of homelessness because we know that's a traumatic event as soon as that is occurring, um, but there wasn't the funding. So the, the pandemic and the CARES Act really flooded our system with this funding that allowed us to um, be proactive in somebody's uh, potential experience of homelessness and preventing that. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's great to see, especially locally here in Johnson County, the effort from local funders, the city and the county to be able to recognize the benefit and the impact of that funds and to be able to continue to provide that even as the pandemic funding is wrapping up. 
Yeah. And, you know, I was actually going to ask about, you know, pandemic funding. Since, since you brought it up, let's let's move into that. Um, we had um, funding from those acts that you mentioned. Um, you know, tell us how this really changed the landscape of things for you and, and how it could maybe pose challenges as that pandemic era funding comes to an end. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's allowed us to be more flexible. Um, it's allowed us to pilot programs that we always knew would be a success and that we knew would have a successful impact on our um, community response system. Um, but so, yeah, so our hope is that they can continue, right? Because they, while they are federal dollars coming in, there were some um, flexibilities that allowed us to serve more individuals and to try new things. Um, there was also a plethora of dollars. So there was a lot of money coming in, which was very helpful. We were really truly able to meet the needs of the individuals as opposed to rationing it out, so to speak. Um, and so we hope, we hope that um, as this funding wraps up, we can show the great impact that it has had in the community um, to be able to leverage dollars in the future is our, is our hope. But obviously there is a fear. I think Amber, when we talked last week put it perfectly, which I haven't heard it stated like that before, but the COVID cliff, right, of, you know, we received all this money and we were able to start these new programs and do this, this really cool innovative work. And there's the fear that that's going to go away and then what's going to happen to, to this progress that we've made. So we're hoping that we can continue to leverage dollars going forward with the success that we've been able to see. Yeah. So it sounds like you kind of, as you get to the, the edge of this cliff, you almost have to sell yourself and improve your value to, to your, your funders and, and people who are writing the grant checks. Um, yeah, yeah. And those agencies that um, don't have the restrictions, so those that are able to provide the funding to agencies that um, aren't putting those federal restrictions, that's what's really important to be able to do this creative out-of-the-box work. Yeah. And is that, you know, was that a new feature of, of pandemic era funding, the, that flexibility, or, or did you have any of that before? I would say it's new. Um, yes, there were things that we were able to do differently because of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, it, it allowed us to... Um, not have to have all of the all of the requirements in place to create a client file and to move forward with the client file, which sped things up um, and allowed us to meet the needs of of individuals that were really struggling to come in the office to meet for case management, things like that. Um, so it was helpful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, something I'm wondering about is, um, you know, the pandemic has proven to us and um, locally the derecho as well um, in Cedar Rapids. It's proven to us how um, necessary these systems are. Um, you know, we've had an increase in homelessness over the past several years locally, nationally. I, I think I heard it's been on an increased trend for the last seven years. Um, it's really highlighted the work that you all do and the importance of it. What I'm wondering is, um, are, are you treated as such? Are you treated like you are an essential system? Well, I'll jump in. I don't do this work, direct service work. So, um, but just to highlight um, the importance of, of especially those those folks that do, um, you know, it's a uh, it's tough to recruit and re re retain um, qualified, experienced people committed to this work. And it's incredible the people that do do the work. And you know, we want to be able to have the resources to to pay them appropriately and and make sure they stick around and are willing to. To continue doing this critical work, we can have all, all kinds of wonderful programs, but if we don't have the right people to, you know, to do them, then then it won't matter. Yeah, and I will second that. I would just say that I think overall, with the the administrative dollars that come in, are typically capped with federal funds, um, and so I think that also makes it very challenging to do this very hard work that is very taxing on people um, and not being able to pay them necessarily a living wage or have the amount of staff that you necessarily need to um, issue some of these programs. And I think about, you know, the, the pandemic, it was great to have all of these additional funding sources to really meet the needs that we were seeing, such as like eviction dollars that we were, we were able to you know, quickly create an eviction event prevention program and have dollars available for anybody facing eviction, um, you know, before the moratorium went into place. And so we had some of those funds to be able to quickly do that. But it's also, I would say, hard on staff to always having to, um, you know, 
create these new programs and and have the ability to do that and very quickly and you can't just you know go out and hire new staff and get them trained and have things up and running which i know is always i feel bad because i give grants to nonprofits and then that's kind of like the expectation right is that you should just be able to do it but it it is hard to ramp up and then once those monies are gone um, you know, ramping back down to what is, you know, the normal, but um, in reality, we really need those uh, additional opportunities or additional flexible funds to really meet the needs. So like going back to the pandemic funding, I mean, between um, having multiple layers of different subsidies, um, we bought a building that we are now turning into affordable housing. And that's something that like we have never done as a city. Um, but there was this great opportunity with all of these additional funding sources to be able to do something like that. Um, and it's great to be able to have that opportunity and provide um, additional housing that will be owned by a nonprofit that kind of reduces those barriers um, for people getting into housing. So having that ability or having that funding, those funding sources that are flexible so that we can do projects like this. And even that project, right, took like four different federal funding sources. So it's definitely not easy, but um, we would not have had that opportunity without those additional funding sources. So I just want to throw that in there too. Absolutely. Is our patchwork system a strength or a challenge or maybe a little bit of both? You know, what do we do well in Iowa? And, you know, what areas could we stand to see some improvement in? So I, I can jump in. Um, so I was thinking about this. Um, it, it reminds me of my favorite book of the past year, which is Homelessness uh, is a Housing Problem. Um, and so it just highlights how housing is the key at the community level. Um, so certainly individual factors like, you know, mental health or substance use disorders or domestic violence or even poverty, those those things make an individual more likely to experience homelessness, but at the community level, we just don't have the housing. And so um, uh, there's there's an analogy in the book that I really love. It's a, it's a, a game of musical chairs. This has been talked about a lot in, in the homeless services world, but um, if you're playing a game of musical chairs and Bill is on crutches because he has a broken leg, at the, the music stops, Bill is likely to be the one without a chair. But is the problem that Bill had a broken leg or is the problem that there weren't enough chairs? So I, I don't know if that was too quick to, you know, to convey, but we just simply don't have enough affordable housing. And so I think about the patchwork of, of services and um, that are out there and no matter what our homeless services providers are doing, which is all really incredible, great and necessary work. But if we don't have the housing, um, if we have these other systems, you know, healthcare is a big one too, but if we don't have the housing, um, then it just, it's, it's just not gonna work the way we want it to. Or the landlords to accept people that have some additional barriers. I think that's the other key thing to note there too, because we're we're building more housing and that's great. And we have, you know, state funding that's, you know, providing or federal funding that's providing, um, you know, money to create this housing. But if we don't have landlords that are willing to set, accept somebody with under a 600 credit score or a past eviction from five years ago, or maybe a felony from 10 years ago, I mean, what you know, these, these folks are just never going to get housed. And I think that's where it becomes very challenging. And I know Janae talks about this all the time. It's just like you have certain landlords that you work with and there's just not enough landlords that are even willing to accept a Section 8 voucher. I can provide vouchers to people all day long. doesn't mean that they're going to find housing. And that's really upsetting when someone has a, you know, the ability to pay over a thousand dollars in rent to a landlord and they just won't, can't get accepted because somebody just does not want to deal with one extra inspection every other year. It's it's just ridiculous. Sorry. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're here for. Um, and, and you know, I know that Section Eight issue has been huge with um, in the last few years since landlords have legally been allowed to to discriminate against folks um, with that, which is um, a, probably a whole session on its own. But um, you know, Janae, tell me about you know what you think uh, with the patchwork whether it's uh, a strength, a challenge, a little bit of both. You spoke to um, just uh, the, the changing um, complexity of needs today. Um, and I'm wondering how that plays into our patchwork today, if it, if it works well into it or if it doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, being on the end of a service provider, I think the patchwork is working well in the terms of the service providers, really working together to see what what resource is best going to meet this individual's needs? Um, what case manager is going to match best with this case manager? Which client's going to match best, best with the landlord? Sorry, I can't talk. 
you know, um, really doing that kind of patchwork um, and then the entities coming together to truly collaborate. What um, I think sometimes we get stuck on is understanding that we don't, we don't all work in our silos and we can't work in our silos to really address these complex needs. So I think the problem is homeless service providers work amazing together, right? We're collaborating, we're, we're meeting with each other almost every single day to discuss something, right? But then you have the mental health system that's not playing into that and that, that relationship is strained and then you have the mental health side of things and that relationship is strained and then physical health is is so privatized and it depends which you know which what insurance provider or which mco this individual has on where they can go so um i think in terms of like that we do need to improve that system we need to make sure that when an individual is experiencing homelessness, we are meeting their needs holistically. And it's not just on the homeless service providers to house them and they're good to go, right? Or it's not just um, you have a mental health outreach person go out and meet with them and they're gonna handle their needs from there. We really need to stay focused on what are we good at? What do we do well? And then really work together to wrap around that individual holistically. Um, so that's where we need to improve, I believe on in our, in our patchwork. Yeah, um, we, we have a question from an attendee here um, who wants to know, for the individuals you serve, are you seeing an increase of folks diagnosed with an intellectual, physical, or developmental disability? Um, and, and I thought that that might be something worth answering given the increasing complexity of needs here. I know among uh, literally unsheltered folks, um, the folks who are outdoors um, by and large are living out there for months and years on end and that has huge impacts on mental health as well. Yeah, I would say the vast majority of individuals we are serving either already have um, social security disability income um, or that we are helping go through that process with them. So um, especially the, the singles who have been experiencing literal homelessness for quite some time, almost every, I, I would say, and this is just my opinion, so there's no stats behind this, but probably 95 to 98% of them are suffering from some form of disability. Wow, okay, great. Um, Sarah, last year, the, the National Alliance to End Homelessness studied Cedar Rapids system and made some recommendations. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me some of the biggest takeaways from that. Um, and if there were any findings or any recommendations that, you know, really surprised you guys. Yeah, so um, this really started out of, um, of a, a housing, uh, the Housing Solutions Lab cohort that we were part of. Um, it was the NYU um, Furman Center that um, put that on. Um, and they had provided some like best practices to our group. And so we had reached out to them to see if they could provide um, some information to our community and really what we started as like a nimbyism type of conversation, which then turned into, hey, let's just uh, get together with all of the folks in Cedar Rapids and look at your individualized data and um, and provide some recommendations on um, after we take a look at your system. I think what's been challenging in the past is that we are part of a, a 96 county uh, continuum of care. And so all of our data gets uploaded and, and really is looked at as that 96 county um, group. And so they were able to really, um, by the work of Janae, I have to give her props on that because she worked with them nonstop to pull out um, Lynn County's specific data. So we could really take a look at what is happening here in our community versus maybe rural Iowa somewhere else um, and uh, find out, you know, what those next steps would be. And so I think, um, you know, one of my biggest uh, takeaways was on diversion, which I know Janae has already talked about, but we played this little game where, you know, you had people in your shelter, you were the running, you were running the shelter and you had people coming in and people exiting for different types of housing, whether it was permanent supportive housing, um, regular housing, rentals, that type of thing. Um, but this influx of people just kept coming in. So you could never keep up with the flow of people coming in. And it really just was that aha moment of, we really need to invest in diversion, which was also one of their recommendations to make sure that we slow that inflow of people, really reduce the amount of people starting to experience homelessness. And so having those conversations, and I think the other ha aha moment was when, um, I can't remember if it was a police officer or a sheriff, Lynn County Sheriff that had said, you know, I am always working with folks um, that are experiencing homelessness. I could do diversion. 
I could do diversion at my window, you know, whenever somebody comes in and is asking about a Section 8 voucher, any one of us can do diversion. And so that was really my aha moment. And I know for many others as well, that we all are in this together. We need to do diversion. We need to help people, which is really just a conversation. Danae always says this much better than I do, but it's just the conversation of, you know, looking for other opportunities that you may have that you're not even thinking about. Can you stay with an aunt or uncle? Can you stay with a cousin? Can you stay with a friend? So that they're not entering that, not becoming literally homeless. So that was my big aha moment. But one of the other recommendations that came out of that was um, the need to really look at our lo local data. And while we all do this together, it is very challenging with all of the other things that we do in our, our you know, normal jobs. Uh, to really stay focused on this in a way that um, is creating recommendations and priorities on policies and, and recommendations on policies. And so um, creating a, um, a local oversight board to look at our data, make recommendations, as well as um, the creation of a homeless systems uh, manager that will be their primary focus. And so looking at that quarterly data, making those recommendations to the oversight board, having that review committee um, provide those recommendations to both the Board of Supervisors and uh, our City Council. And so I'm um, happy to say that that has been funded for a three-year term, uh, and we will be housing that position within the Housing Fund for Lynn County. Um, and so hopefully they will be hiring that position here in the very, uh, very near future. So very awesome. excited. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be great work. And then I think, you know, this is going to be information maybe next year we can bring and share kind of what um, has become of um, that position and and really what those what those data points look like and what those recommendations are. Okay. I just want to make a really quick, really cool bragging plug really fast. So, yeah. you know, we started Diversion back in 2016 before we even really knew that it was a thing. We just saw that it was, you know, it just made sense. It didn't make sense to push people into homelessness to then turn, have to turn around and try and solve their homelessness, right? So we've been working on this and here in Cedar Rapids, we've gotten really collaborative and really creative on thinking outside the box and how do we do diversion differently? It shouldn't just be keeping people out of shelter. It should be keeping people out of the system. So last week, I just want to brag really quick. Um, the city of Denver, Colorado actually reached out to us and they want us to help them kind of talk through how they can start doing different diversion tactics within the city of Denver because they are really struggling with their homeless population over there. So that was really cool to hear that like somehow it got back to them, the cool work that we're doing here at Waypoint and, and in Cedar Rapids with Diversion um, to help them in their community. So that was really cool. So I just wanted to put that big brag in really quick that since Sarah brought up Diversion. <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to say the Waypoint has always done this well. So um, it was just my aha moment that I was trying to say, not Waypoints, because clearly they've been doing this for some time. So thanks. I smell a story coming with that that contact from Denver. So be on, be looking at your email for me. Um, you know, something that's um, come up in my reporting on homelessness over and over is the need for permanent supportive housing and housing outside of emergency shelters. Um, we know that diversion is so critical because once you enter the cycle of homelessness, it's substantially more difficult to get out of it. Um, you know, but when you're in it, for most folks that we're seeing today, um, they're in need of permanent supportive housing with that case management element. Um, you know, tell us a little bit more about what the need for this looks like and, and why it's so necessary with today's population. I'll take this one. Uh, so permit supported housing is, I mean, we have a great need of, of permit supported housing locally, across the state, across the country. Um, you know, permanent supported housing is, uh, it's housing that is permanent, so people can live there for the rest of their life if they so choose, right? And it comes with supports. And if you can think about the individuals that um, we're serving who have reached the homeless system, right, and are now in emergency shelter or sleeping and living in a place not meant for habitation, you know, these are individuals who have um, struggled to navigate all of our systems um, that are really complicated and, um, and they need that person to walk alongside them to really help them uh, help advocate for them, help um, educate, and also just help navigate just the challenges that sometimes that come along with our systems of care. Um, and so permanent supported housing, you know, here in Johnson County, um, Shelter House operates 60 units of single site permit supported housing, and then um, over 100, 147 scattered sites. So we are in 230 units across the community providing permanent supported housing. And that's not enough. 
Um, you know, we are seeing individuals, as I mentioned before, who are their the complexity of care, their both physical health, mental health, and substance use. Um, oftentimes, uh, navigating the healthcare system, the judicial system, can can really um, either take up a lot of somebody's time or it's ignored completely. Um, and either one of those options you uh, are not great, right? And so having somebody help to support you while in housing, so that way, hey, I can work on getting my basic needs met, um, my housing, my food, my uh, the security and safety, right? Um, while having somebody else come alongside and be able to work on some other goals with me um, and help prioritize what those goals are. Um, you know, the individuals that we're serving, they've really worked on just meeting their basic needs um, when you're in that crisis of homelessness. And so coming out of that and really being able to um, find supportive environments of individuals that not only where you have case management, but you also have healthcare providers potentially inside your um, you know, your service, like it within our buildings to be able to take time to get to know the individuals um, and really be able to um, talk about the type of care that they need and rebuild that trust um, with healthcare systems. But all, honestly, all of our systems is it takes a long time um, and it takes uh, a, a uh, patience. And, and I think where we have uh, seen the impact of permanent supported housing by the length, I mean, locally here, we've seen individuals retain their housing um, and be able to work on goals. Uh, we have individuals who have moved out of permanent supported housing and now live independently in the community with some additional supports. Um, and so just when we start to look at our homeless response system, we start to look at those uh, point in time numbers, right? Um, what we're seeing is a lack of affordable housing, but we're also seeing a lack of housing supports that are appropriate for the individuals. And so being able to expand permanent supported housing mm -hmm. is, is, I think, an essential need. We don't want to expand our homeless crisis system, right? Um, our emergency shelters is not where we want to uh, invest our money. We want to invest in housing so that we can move people out of it, that experience of housing and hope that they never return. Um, and so those permanent supported housing services help reduce that recidivism rate right, that oftentimes we see um, some people returning to that experience. Um, and I think when you start to talk about patchwork rate right, of, of funding streams, this is part of that challenge that we've, we can um, all in this room kind of talk about in terms of how challenging it is to weave all of these different funding streams together to make a permanent supported housing program possible. Um, and, um, and we live in a pretty rural um, state as in its entirety. We have um, people from major cities here in this room now, but um, being able to look at this from a rural perspective as well, and how do we expand those affordable permanent supported housing units across the state, um, so that way people are not having to relocate to a larger city to be able to access those resources is another challenge I think that we just we have, um, and that I see areas that you know we as a state are going to need to continue to focus on, um, which really comes down to that funding and the available funding um, that is uh, here in the state. Absolutely. Um, you know, so we've touched on, you know, funding challenges, we've touched on support of housing, housing stock. Um, at the forefront of all this, we have um, our staff at these agencies who, um, you know, without the funding, it's great. The housing is great on its own, but, you know, without the staff, it really wouldn't be worth much, would it? Um, you know, the staff are the liaison. They um, help move folks through the process and through the patchwork. Um, and I know right now wages are competitive. We're in a tight labor market. Um, we have a question from the audience here. Um, what are you as agencies doing to address low staff wages? Which funding sources are used to pay for shelter employees? Um, you could probably apply that to which, which funding sources are used to pay um, management employees. Uh, how, are, how can we increase these funds? We need discussion on improving the staffing retention crisis and morale so services can be delivered more effectively. Um, so if anybody wants to address you know, low staffing wages, how you guys are 
navigating that issue right now to retain folks. Yeah, I can I can jump in and then I'm sure Aaron has some to add as well. But, um, you know, here at Waypoint, um, obviously, we we do the best that we can to pay um, staff a livable wage. Um, you know, the, the, the struggle with that is kind of what Sarah alluded to earlier is that when you receive grants, there's only a certain percentage that can go towards staffing. Um, and the vast majority of your funding is allocated towards direct client assistance or whatever that um, that grant was for, right? So um, I think sometimes there's this, this you know, this um, belief that, when there's an article that goes out and says, oh, the, I'm just going to use this as an example. So but when it goes out and says, oh, the county received $2.7 million for renters assistance, um, but then that money is gone in six months, right? There's this belief that that all went to pay staff, or that's what we hear, right? And we get emails and, and um, trolls about that, right? And the reality is, is that money does go to clients that does go out the door to as direct client assistance, a very small percentage is allowed to pay for staffing. So really, um, programs and agencies are reliant on those non restricted funds, um, donations from the community, that's really what we rely on to be able to pay staff. Um, the wages that they need to be paid to do this work and be able to spend the money that we get for the direct client assistance. Um, there's also, you know, when the COVID money came in, there is this big, all of these articles about all of this money was sent for housing and none of it's getting spent. And that means that there's no use for it and, um, or agencies are just holding on to it. And that also wasn't true, but the reality of it was, is there was so much money that had to go out the door to clients, but there was no money to pay the staff to actually do the work. There was no money to pay the staff to do the case management, the la landlord advocacy, the housing inspections. Like it's not just cutting a check and that's what people don't realize. Um, so sorry to go off on a tangent there, but then the flip side is, you know, here at Waypoint, we really are focusing on mental health. So allowing for more mental health days that um, staff can take without having to utilize their PTO, being extremely flexible with their work schedule, knowing that if they need to come in a little later, that's okay, or they need to take off early because they had a rough day, that's okay. Um, allowing them to prioritize their families. You know, we understand their employees here, but they are a family um, and they have needs outside of work and, and respecting those and honoring those for our staff um, goes a long way. So those are some things that we're doing here to really help um, make sure that we're taking care of, you know, taking care of their mental health as well. Yeah, you know, vicarious trauma and, and secondhand PTSD is a very real thing. Yep. I'm glad to hear that you're you're doing something to address that. Um, you each represent um, kind of different facets of the system. And, you know, what I'm wondering is if you ever feel like there's too much pressure on one particular part of our system. And if so, how does that affect um, you or your staff? I'll just speak for um, for Des Moines. Um, I, I think um, as a city, we rely so much on our nonprofit service provider partners, um, including to address emergency situations when they arise. So um, I think there is a lot of pressure on on these partner agencies, and and in particular in different different lanes. We might only have a couple, you know, one or two providers that do permanent supportive housing, or one or two providers that do a certain type of shelter. Um, and so, so um, yeah, it just creates a lot of pressure in, in these different areas. Yeah. Erin, what do you think? Do, you, do we have any pressure on any parts of our system? Yeah, you know, I was just thinking about that question because um, when you think about our systems and the gaps and the holes in, uh, in our systems, I mean, I would say that the homeless response system as a whole feels pressure, right? Because when somebody has failed throughout all of these other systems, um, they wind up in the door or in on the phone with somebody um, responding to that immediate crisis, which is their housing crisis, right? And so um, I have a really loud plane happening outside my window, so I hope you guys can hear me. Um, so I, you know, I think just the homeless response system in general receives an, uh, the mo uh, a high amount of pressure. Um, and there, by the time somebody is in the system, they have nowhere else to go. You've gone through the diversion, you've gone through, you know, the healthcare system, the judicial system. And if they're walking in the doors of, a, of an emergency shelter, um, then our system has failed. 
And so that pressure then to um, navigate um, and rebuild and help that individual move back into our community and um, live stably is, is that's a, it is a lot of pressure and it's navigating a lot of relationships. So we've talked about healthcare um, and, but I think something worth noting is, you know, I talk a lot about our case managers um, and how much work it takes to navigate the housing um, world within a community and landlords. And we've talked about the barriers, right? But it's then the relationship and maintaining those relationships with those landlords once somebody has moved into housing um, because there are challenges that come up. And so that, that, um, that case manager, you know, for as much as uh, they need to know all of our different resources that are available within a community, they also are a salesperson. Um, and they are selling, you know, not necessarily the each individual person, but they're selling almost themselves and the services and the case management and the funding that is available to support these individuals. Um, and then having to get creative. I mean, the creativity level of a case manager within this field is high. Um, you, you're you're navigating, um, communicating with sometimes a really difficult population to reach out to, right? Based on losing their phone or not having a, a way to get in contact with somebody, while also having to um, kind of focus on the the mm -hmm. landlord needs at times. And so, um, you know, I think that it's I the, our case managers don't and this kind of goes back into kind of that conversation in terms of rate of pay and wage right our case managers just don't get enough credit in general in terms of the the challenges that this population uh come with and and how um I just like energized they are to talk to a community-wide system to really re uh, establish care for this person and remind people that this is an individual in our community that um, deserves to re be received with dignity. Um, and, and I think that that when you start to talk about pressure, um, that that's that can that pressure adds up and um, and our our direct service staff are the ones who are uh, oftentimes feeling that the most. Yeah, it's, you know, it's crazy to think about just the the level of intricacy that um, staffers like that have to deal with. You know, a lot of us take for granted having a driver's license, a birth certificate, a social security card, um, a phone number or an email to access anything that we may need to access, an address for correspondence. Um, and they have to, you know, set up all these things and then things within things to just do their job. So um, do we need any, um, do you think we need a statewide agency dedicated to advocating for issues on homelessness, how would that potentially help or change things? I know we have the Iowa Council on Homelessness, which um, you know might fall into that category, but do you think we need anything um, bigger or maybe a little bit more robust? Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in. I was hoping, <laughs> waiting for somebody else to, but yeah, I do. Um, I think that there are some policy changes that, um, that if, if elected officials were educated on and could move the needle a little bit would make our jobs a lot easier. It would make us make it easier to rehouse. Um, I think it would also probably reduce the risk of households becoming homeless. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I would think having somebody to lobby um, and to really educate policymakers on change would be extremely um, beneficial to the work that we do. Absolutely. I think there's examples of um, uh, you said advocacy groups, but also coalitions uh, for homelessness across the country and other states um, that work really effectively. Um, and so, you know, just this week there was a kind of separate conversation that I was having, and we were looking at Colorado and specifically their coalition for uh, homelessness. And there's just there there are some really um, well thought out and and uh, well established coalitions that are um, very and have had great impact in other states across the country. And so I think that's an area of opportunity um, that we as a state could look at and and should should. Yeah, um, a couple of you brought up an, an interesting point um, 
educating the folks who are in charge of policy. Um, this week, the Iowa House introduced a bill that would have relegated resources to creating state sanctioned encampments. Um, and it would have cut state funding um, to cities that refuse to enforce a ban on unsanctioned homeless encampments. So just people sleeping outside as they normally do. Um, you know, the bill passed its subcommittee and then it was killed in committee. Um, so it's, it's not going to become law at this point, but it indicates, I think, that this issue has gotten a lot of uh, attention in our legislature. Um, what does this kind of bill say to you about the current mentality our state has on homelessness by and large? We, we, we know we have great folks doing work on the ground everywhere, but, um, you know, what does this kind of legislation say to you? I'll jump in on an optimistic note. Um, so I truly do think that most people um, have good intentions and want to help address the real problems of homelessness. Um, homelessness is not good for anybody. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just, I, any, anytime legislators are willing to put time and energy and, and thought into homelessness, I am, I am optimistic that we can work together and find some, some good, good solutions together. Absolutely. How about on just the, just the merits of it, you know, as, as I've simplified it here, we have, um, you know, kind of a carrot, we have a, a good thing, which is funding for um, a site where folks can get bathroom showers, um, you know, maybe plug in their phone, that kind of thing. But we also have, um, you know, kind of a stick where um, enforcing that that's the only place that they can do that. Would that um, pose a challenge for your clients right now and for your organizations? I would just say going back to what the National Alliance to End Homelessness, you know, has stated in um, in our conversations with them that um, that there's no one solution to homelessness, and so I think we have to always just be very mindful that we have to have different ways of addressing homelessness, and there's not one way that's going to necessarily, um, uh, you know, solve those issues, and so, um, you know making sure that we are responding with um, in a trauma-informed way, making sure that we are having housing first as a priority um, because it costs less to actually house people than it does to incarcerate people. Um, we have studies that have proven that as well. So just, again, making sure that we are aligning um, our response, um, again, in, in a way that is actually um, housing and helping people um, would be my response to that. Absolutely. What do you guys think that we can do to better stitch together this patchwork that we have um, for someone's journey and make it more seamless from um, the intake point to the exit point to being a productive part of our community? Um, you know, in an ideal world, what would the system look like? How would it look different than it looks now? I'll, I'll jump in and um, just refer back to a gaps analysis that um, that the city of, or not the city of Des Moines, um, that Homeward, our community yeah. here, um, just completed, and um, it had some some really good good data, good um, kind of led the way to some different priorities for our community. But one of the one of the takeaways for me is just the the importance of the permanent pathways out of homelessness. Um, and so the way it is right now in, in Des Moines, you know, our, our shelters are literally all full and um, over capacity and, um, and people tend to um, stay in shelter or kind of cycle in and out of shelter unsheltered situations because they're, because they're not sufficient exits to permanent housing, not sufficient permanent pathways out. And so, um, so for me, I just, I just think you know, as we're thinking about kind of the patchwork of resources, you know, we have to start with creating more and more of those permanent pathways out so to kind of unstick the whole system, right? So that there's that flows, emergency shelters can focus on, um, you know, the truly short-term needs of, of folks that are just entering homelessness for the first time. Um, and the people that need more intensive and long-term services are able to get the, you know, that resource, kind of lift them out of the shelter system, if you will. Um, and sort of just enable the whole system to kind of flow and that patchwork to, you know, to knit together better. Yeah. Janine and Aaron, I, I want to hear from you and what you think, um, you know, we can better do to pull 
all of this together? Do we have all the right services and, you know, maybe just need to get people into the right places or what do you think? Yeah, you know, I would, no, I was just going to like to see, um, I would like to see more of our systems um, be a part of that coordinated entry um, system. I think um, part of the challenge with, there's challenges with that, right? So data sharing and, and confidentiality and HIPAA and, and all of those things that are put in place to protect individuals. Um, that, but it also, I think is really, um, it would be, I think we would look at it, uh, there would be a definitely a preventative measure um, that would come into play when you start to have healthcare systems and judicial sy systems that are going to be, or could potentially be more of a partner um, within that, whether it's coordinated entry or some sort of community kind of care conversation, um, especially for those who are, are most challenging and or have the highest barriers in our community. Um, so that's just something, it, also data sharing um, and uh, looking at outcomes from a community-based standpoint rather than an individual system and or service uh, uh, standpoint, I think would also be an area that I just would like to see growth in. Um, and those are all very challenging and time-consuming, and I can tell you from a uh, homeless response uh, system and and uh, permanent supportive housing, you know, those are not funded services. So when, when we start to talk about uh, the funding that we receive and, and being able to have somebody who's truly focused on um, outcomes and data analysis, those are not funded um, uh, duties or responsibilities. And we're oftentimes putting that into um, uh, other job duties that are already, you know, pretty maximized. And so I, that, th that's just another area of how can we continue to grow our um, data sharing, data reviewing and analysis to be able to have a better picture of the individuals, not just within a single system, but across our systems. Absolutely. And then Janae, I, I know you wanted to you were chomping at the bit to answer that, so I'll let you give your two cents. No, that's okay. Erin really took the words right out of my mouth. Is really making sure that our other um, our other systems come into play with this as well. So mental health, um, you know, substance abuse, and then physical health as well. I also think I'm just going to put another plug for diversion because it matters and it's important that it should not just be the homeless service providers doing diversion. In order to have effective diversion, it is any entity across this community that is making or, or coming in contact with somebody that's struggling with housing, that's who needs to be having that diversion conversation and, and getting people to think outside the box and how can they rely on their own resources. So that also reduces um, reduces the strain on the system and allows the system to truly focus on those most in need. So um, those are the two things I think. Yeah, um, we have a, a question from the audience that I think is perfect to wrap this all up. Um, they're asking, what can we as individuals do to help with this problem? How do we get involved? Um, you know, what can the everyday Joe do? What can business owners do, um, you know, to advocate for this issue either passively or directly um, and help you make progress on the ground, even if it's in small ways. Can I just say, because it's top of mind, but advocate for affordable housing because affordable housing is a spectrum of housing. And I think there's a stigma that goes along with that. And usually you have um, individuals from maybe a neighborhood that may come up and speak, um, you know, against uh, an affordable housing project, but I think we definitely need more folks to come up and speak on behalf of those types of projects, because um, if we keep shooting down affordable housing and then um, citizens want to know why people are homeless, I mean, it's, we can't have, you can't do both. So um, we can't just send people somewhere else. These are people that live in our community. Um, they're our friends, our family, our neighbors. And so we have to make sure that we have housing that's available in our community for these people. So um, support affordable housing building. Thank you. Yeah. I think you had mentioned earlier um, NIMBYism, and I just wanted to um, clarify for the people who don't know what that is. It's not in my backyard. So thank you. <laughs> Anyone else on that, on, on what folks can do to help you out here on a daily basis? Just educating um, yourself and your neighbors, your friends, your family. Um, housing and homelessness is my tagline. So in order for us to really move towards a 
stronger, thriving community, we really have to get people housed. We have to have abundant housing within our community, meaning that housing is available for all of those individuals in need. Well, everybody needs housing, right? Um, and then, you know, if you have the opportunity to donate, you know, donate to the to the agencies that are out there doing the work, help support them in that way. Um, because like I talked about earlier, that flexible funding goes a long way. It allows us to be more creative um, with our approach. Absolutely. Well, I think that is our time for today. And my goodness, it certainly has flown by. Um, I wanna thank all of our attendees for being a part of our session today. And I wanna thank our wonderful panelists for lending their ideas and their expertise this morning, um, afternoon rather. Um, tomorrow's session, Housing for Vulnerable Populations, will explore how the spike in construction and um, inflation costs plays out in the mounting issues with affordable housing and homelessness. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you at noon tomorrow.